All right, gents, should we get started? Okay, let's get started. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I want to welcome you today to the webinar and thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedules. Uh, my name is Stephanie Hagstrom and I'm the Director of Community Development for the Research Data Alliance US. Let me get to my the Research Data Alliance is a community of over 11,500 data experts from around the globe who collaborate together in building the social and technical bridges to enable open sharing and reuse of data. The RDA US is a recognized region of the Research Data Alliance represented by 3,000 members and they support the global operations and help strengthen the data science infrastructure community. If you are not already a member of the RDA and you're here, we would love for you to join. It's a very vibrant, active community and we would welcome your participation. And down here is the um, link to get there if you take a minute. Okay, before we get started, I wanna go over a couple of housekeeping items. Um, we will be recording this presentation and I will, we will be adding a link to the page that's on the website uh, after this meeting. We have to clean it up a little bit and then we'll put it on. We'll also upload the slides to the same page. Um, we will have time, we plan on leaving time at the end of the presentation for the presenter, for Jens to be able to answer questions. But because the webinar is set to audience mess members to listen mode only, we ask that you please use the Q&A option. So there's chat and there's Q&A. We would prefer to that, that you use the Q&A option, which is in located in your Zoom control panel. But I will be scanning chat if, if uh, that's easier for you to put it in there. Okay, so today's webinar is hosted by the RDA US, and it's the third in a webinar series that we're putting on highlighting RDA recommendations and outputs. It's with my pleasure to be able to introduce Jens and the webinar topic today. Um, I think we had, we were looking at the numbers, we had um, almost 200 people sign up. We'll see how many show up, but uh, a great turnout. And today's webinar is called Versioning Data is about more than revisions, a conceptual framework and proposed principles. And it's being presented by Jens Klump. Jens is an earth science informatics principal research scientist who leads the geoscience analytics team in the middle mineral resources group at CSIRO based in Perth, Western Australia. CSIRO is the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization and is an Australian government agency responsible for scientific research. Jen's research topics include data-driven science and machine learning, virtual research environments, programmatic access to data, high performance and cloud computing, and the development of system solutions for large geoscience projects. Jens has a degree in geology and in oceanography from the University of Cape Town, UCT. And he received his PhD in marine geology from the University of Bremen, Germany. He has more than 20 years. Oh, I forgot to switch my slide, sorry. He has more than 20 years, um, sorry, experience in designing and building research data infrastructures. He's also an active member of the RDA since 2013, including as co-chair of the Data Versioning Working Group and the Physical Samples and Collections in Research Data Ecosystem Interest Group. I am pleased to turn this over to you, Jens, and you can share the outcomes and share about what you're gonna be presenting today. Thank you so much. And I'll go ahead and stop sharing and you can take it from here. Thank you very much, Stephanie, for the introduction. And thank you for everybody attending today. And for those in Western Australia, thank you for getting up early. It's an early start. And for those in the US, it's a long day. So I hope this seemingly dry topic won't stay just dry and um, you will get something out of it for your work and maybe also the 
a single moment of entertainment. <laughs> so um, before I dive into the topic, I would like to acknowledge um, all the people that, who contributed to this work, the um, co-chairs and co-authors on the white paper, um, Leslie Wyburn, who's online here to support me in the Q&A, uh, Ming Feng Wu from ARDC, Julia Martin, also ARDC, Ari Asmi from the University of Helsinki, and Robert Downs at Columbia University. And thank you also to all the contributors of use cases, uh, REA Technical Advisory Board liaisons who guided us through the process, the Australian Research Data Commons and Jerry Ryder, and the reviewers who con also um, contributed quite a bit to make the, our outcomes more coherent and readable. So why versioning? Um, a data set that you want to use for research <clears throat> might get changed over time to correct errors. Maybe someone applied a new algorithm or added new data, for instance, if it's an ongoing time series. And then also the way data sets get distributed um, has an influence on that is data get bundled into collections distributed in different encodings or mirrored onto different platforms. And all of these differences are points that you need to understand if you want to cite the exact version that you worked with to underpin your research. And if you can't do that, that, in, that does impact the reproducibility of your research results. Um, so, and then also, um, systematic versioning contributes, contributes to the FAIR principles. The FAIR principles note that you should do versioning, but it doesn't tell you what it is and how you do it. So it's a matter of reproducibility. Which exact file did I use in terms of content? Which exact file did I use in terms of format? Because maybe my uh, processing algorithm stumble if the format changes. Where did it come from? Has it changed since then? And can I use the new version? If the structure has changed, does that impact the way I process it? And then there's also the question of attribution. Who do I cite um, and what do I cite? Whose idea was it? Whose creative and intellectual output is this data set? And who generated it? And then where did I find it and who hosted it? This kind of a lot more questions than just version one and version two. And this didn't come out of nowhere. There was prior work in RDA. Um, in particular, the, um, the Dyn Dynamic Data Citation Working Group developed a set of recommendations that were presented at the RDA Plenary 8 in Denver in 2016. And it starts with recommendation one to version the data set. But what does that mean? They didn't say. They did say quite a bit about how versioning on dynamic data sets should work, that um, there should be a way to retrieve earlier states, um, that there should be markers that, ins that indicate in inserts, updates, and deletes. The time stamping might be a way to achieve that. And then there should be identifiers that help you through persistent ID to point at a particular timestamp query the resolving to a landing page. Um, at the bottom is the DOI link to that output. Uh, it's really worth reading. But when we read this in 2016, we felt there was something missing because um, yes, it did address the, all these aspects of rapidly changing data sets in terms of the bitstream very well in the way for quite specific use cases. It could be generalized, but we felt there was something missing. So we asked the question, what, what then constitutes a version? Is it the difference in content? Is it the difference in presentation? Is it really just the bitstream? The thing that I thought was really missing from the dynamic data, um, data set uh, citation recommendations was that it didn't talk about the significance of a change. And link, just linking that to magnitude, I felt wasn't the right approach. 
because um, when you look at what change means for information, size doesn't necessarily matter. And um, my favorite example for that is the first major split in the Christian church around 300 common era over the words homo usion versus homo usion. And you can see that the difference between the two words is just one letter. The Levenstein distance between those two strings is just one, the smallest difference possible. And still it split the early church. So just looking at the magnitude of change doesn't tell you about the significance. And then um, another nice example um, of versioning comes from media like books. So if you take Tolstoy's War and Peace as an example, um, and my colleagues at ARDC made the search for um, the announcement of this webinar, and they found 113 editions of Tolstoy's War and Peace. There's the original Russian version published in 1867. There's various translations um, and editions and formats on Kindle, audiobook, ebook, paperback, etc. And and it goes on. So how do you describe all of those versions and how they relate to each other? And so this is how the working group came about. We try to implement this dy dynamic data citation working group recommendations at the National Computational Infrastructure, NCI in Canberra. And we realized that it wasn't that easy. And to understand what was happening, we thought that the best way would be to collect use cases and analyze them to understand what people were doing and how we could put this into a conceptual framework. So we started in 2016 with a birds of a feather session at plenary eight in Denver and have met since then every six months to update the community and have further discussions. And of course, there was work between meetings, um, transitioning from a birds of a feather to test the waters if there was any interest in this topic starting to run a, an interest group and then transforming that into a working group. The difference in RDA is that an interest group just can go on as long as there's interest, while a working group has 18 months to produce an outcome. And so that's what we did. We worked on this question, um, analyzed and collected and analyzed um, use cases, and published a draft report for um, comment and then the final report that then was adopted by the technical advisory board um, and brought that back to the community and then decided that there were still enough questions uh, that merit continuing as an interest group. So the topic keeps us busy, but now back as interest group. So with the use cases, we collected 39 data versioning practice use cases from 33 organizations across the globe, from different research domains, social and economic science, earth science, molecular bioscience, it's, um, climate, many others, um, and quite a number of different data types. And these use cases give us a good overview of the current practices reported by the, the, those data centers and users. And um, they helped us identify differences in data versioning practices between data providers and highlighting the issues they encountered. So um, this is just a very short excerpt of questions that we distilled from these use cases. So the one of the questions was, what constitutes a new release of a data set? And how, how should it be identified? And the, the, the couple of acronyms of organizations that raised this question. Then the, the question of significance of change is um, something that everybody noted, that they didn't know how to handle that. Then a question that came up was, does changes in the metadata change the version of the associated data set? What needs to be included in the versioning history? Should um, a version be named or numbered? 
and um, what um, versioning information should be included in the data citation. Just as an example, there were a couple of more, more questions, uh, but I won't go through them in, in detail now because you can read them yourself. We published the use cases, um, the DOIs at the bottom right corner, at the bottom left corner of the slide. And so it's, it's a collection of all these 39 use cases and we will continue and collecting further use cases and publish a future version of this document. Interesting uh, is that um, compared to the white paper, a far fewer people read, far fewer number of people read the use cases. It's now, yeah, just over 1800 reads. And uh, compared to the white paper that received almost 8,000 reads until now, um, the, there's the DOI link at the center left. Um, so you can go to that um, document, our final report. We received only two comments in writing on, on this, which um, was less than we expected, but we had a lot of discussion before we published the white paper. So maybe we covered most questions and concerns, but you can bring more questions to us in the Q&A today. The feedback was incorporated into the revised vision of the report. And we then used this material to publish a paper in the data science journal, which you can find in the DOI at the bottom of this page. And you can Google it. And then an important concept in what we, uh, um, an important concept that we used in, in our um, analysis was the concept of a designated user community. This is a concept that comes from the Open Archival Information Systems standard, and it defines a designated community as an identified group of potential consumers um, sh who should be able to understand a particular set of information. And this designated community may be composed of multiple user communities, the designated user community is defined by the archive and its uh, definition may change over time. So from an archival perspective, it's important to keep that time perspective that the community might change. But what is important for us is when you communicate the significance of a change, you do this for a designated community. It's not a general a definition. It's that the um, significance of a change should be meaningful to the designated user community. So the principles, the in very short form were that we, the principles that we teased out of all the use cases and the discussions was that we have version control, which we call revision. And this is where we say that each that we can identify each change, like it was proposed in the dynamic data versioning recommendations. But that's only the changes in the bitstream. Then there's the editorial process of data production, which results in a release. And here it's important to communicate the significance of the change. And one of the ways to do that is through semantic versioning. Since Data sets also get bundled in different ways. Uh, it's important to talk about uh, objects and collections, the question of granularity and how to identify collections of objects, time series and other aggregates. The thing that had been overlooked, but we struck upon when we analyzed the use case at NCI was the question of data formats, we call manifestations that identify different formats of the same work. And I'll come back to what manifestation and work means in, in a moment. And then there's of course the question of derived products, the question of provenance that we didn't really go much into, but it's, it's uh, something that versioning helps um, tracking provenance and the information that you need to know about an object and how it was derived from a precursor. So, in the case of version control 
um, the um, revision it, here um, a new instance of a data set that is produced in the course of data management or data production that is different from its precursors called a, re a revision. And you can see the difference in the change of the bitstream over time. And um, as it's, it is good practice in software development, um, a revision should be uniquely identified. It uh, doesn't mean that you have to mint a persistent identifier for every uh, revision that depends on your user community and their needs and the practices in your repository, but at least you should be able to name that there was a revision. And um, so, but it's something that's very commonly applied to the management of software. And then there's the editorial process of data production resulting in a release. The production of a data set can be quite complex and then the data set can go through a number of revisions before it's considered to be final. And then this final version is published and that's what we call a release. And um, this release then must be accompanied accompanied by a description of the nature and the significance of that change and a uh, description of what implications that might have for future use in the designated community. And it's here again that the uh, designated community comes up because they need to understand what that change means. Then we have the granularity that data sets can be bundled in different ways into collections. And these collections themselves can be identified in versions and uh, describe what data sets make up this, uh, this collection. The granularity um, is then dependent on who needs these data sets and what the practices are. And um, time series are a particular case, um, but actually not that mystical. They can be identified as, as collections. Time stamping then makes really a lot of sense, especially if the, they, if the time series is updated frequently. But you can see, see that in analogy to um, say a journal series where you can identify the journal and you can identify every issue of that of that journal, but it's an open time series as long as the journal is active. And you just add more and more issues to it. And then there's the question of formats and, and um, what we call manifestations, because a data set might be expressed in different file formats, or and that might might be just a change in character encoding. This is sometimes referred to as distributions, and they are the same work. There's no difference in the content. It's just the format that changes. The, technically, the, this has the implication that there are differences in the checksums, um, even though the expressed work doesn't change, uh, but they manifest the same work. Um, but this is important to keep in mind because the machine actionability might depend on specific formats or encodings. And so it's important to know which manifestation of a work you're working with and identify that. And then the question of provenance that I won't go into today, but for the question of reproducibility, it's really important to know where a data set came from, if it had any precursors, and how the objects relate to each other. And then when you when we come to citation, then um, you again want to include into a citation some information on the, on the version so that uh, somebody referring to this uh, data set has a means of, of um, understanding which particular version of a data set you used and uh, what that means. There's um, 
not much recommendation around how to do that. Datasite has some recommendation in their uh, metadata schema. Um, I think it's something that still needs to evolve. It's um, still a bit immature. We used a um, particular concept to approach the, this question of the different forms in which we encounter data, the functional requirements for bibliographic resources, Ferber. It's something that's been around for a while, but it's not much loved by the library community. But we found it very useful when, to apply this to data. And I will go through this um, in step by step to, so that you can follow our train of thought. So when we go back to this example of Tolstoy's War and Peace, um, what we have here is the work uh, of Tolstoy's novel. That's what you normally talk about. And then this idea of the work is um, expressed as a novel. And so this is the expression level. And then the novel is manifested in the original Russian version published in 1867, or the edition translated Portuguese by Rubens Figueiredo, published in two volumes by Cossack and Naifi in 2011, and so on. Um, and then that, that's the manifestation level. And then there's a specific book, the original version published in, say, your national library or your university library. And that is an item because it's the actual physical book that relates to that manifestation of the novel, the expression of uh, Tolstoy's idea to write uh, War and Peace, the work ex um, expressed as a novel manifested in the original Russian version and present as an item on the shelf in your library. So when we apply this to data, the question is, what does that mean? Uh, and um, so in the Ferber definition, a work is a distinct intellectual or artistic creation, and it's abstract. And in our understanding and interpretation of Ferber, um, it's um, a research project that prompts the collection of data. That's the work. And it is expressed in a data product that expresses the outcomes of this experiment or research endeavor. And then this data product is manifested. Uh, it has a physical embodiment of the expression of the work. And it is it comes in the form of, say, a data set that is a con uh, characters, separate values, file, a figure, table, uh, relational database, whatever. And then eventually there's the single exemplar of the manifestation um, that is the item. And that's the thing that's downloadable as a data file or stream. And to illustrate that in a fairly complex scenario and the, the, the scenario that prompted us to do this work, we looked at the ASTA project. ASTA is the Advanced Base Borne Thermal Emission and Reflectance Radiometer Instrument built by the Japanese Space Systems and uh, was launched in 1999 in collaboration with NASA. And they, this produces what's called level zero data that's then uh, process to level one and two. So going through a series of algorithms. And then in late 2009, an Australian initi initiative supported by CSIRO, Geoscience Australia, and NCI took um, about three and a half thousand ASTA level 1B and level two scenes and created a level three Australian continental scale mosaic version of this data set. And then there was another set of um, procedures applied to this level three mosaic to generate a suite of 17 level four geoscience mineral maps that then were made available in three different formats. And then 
um, selections of these data products are now available from at least um, 10 different websites. So how do we get in any structure into this to understand what we're looking at? So Leslie Wybon drew this diagram to um, sort all of this out in, into a structure. So going from left to right, we start with the work, the ASTA mission, which is then expressed in a series of data products. And so there's a number of nested life cycles going from le level zero to level four. And we start at the level four product, which is then expressed in 17 individual map products. And these are manifested in three different formats, BSQ, GeoTIFF, and NetCDF, whatever that means, that's, that's not important right now. And these three manifestations are then um, available as items for download from uh, several different sites, from GA, from the Ge State Geological Survey, CSIRO, Digital Earth Australia, and NCI. And you, I think you can start to see that uh, differentiating this into these different levels and helps us identify what we're talking about. Are we talking about the idea of the, the ASTA mission? Are we talking about the data products as an expression of this experiment? Are we talking about different formats or are we talking about concrete files that reside somewhere on the site where they can be retrieved? So just as an insert, does changing metadata constitute a new version in this, in this framework? And the answer is, it depends. If you mean by changing the metadata, changing, changing the catalog entry of the work, then um, it doesn't make a new version because um, you're only changing the catalog entry. You're not changing the work. Unless you want to version the catalog, then the catalog becomes a work in its own right. But in this, in, in this particular perspective, no. But if you talk about um, header information in files, then changing the metadata in the header means you change the manifestation. And that might have uh, effects on downstream processing. So in this case, yes, it's a new version of the manifestation of the work. So in this case, yes, it is a new version. And so Ferber also helps us understand provenance because we can follow this network of um, processing from the work all the way to the items to understand what was derived from where, what and how they relate to each other. So we have the data product that um, is then, that, that then has uh, three different manifestations and is then available as downloadable files as items from several different platforms. There's also the question of attribution, which Ferber, I think, can address, but that needs a bit more work. So again, we have the work level, the, um, the ASTA mission, and usually as if in a scientific publication, you would um, refer to the data product as the thing that you worked with, but you actually worked with a downloadable file and um, which has a certain format, but that's not where the intellectual merit sits. So um, this is a question that I think needs a bit more work and a bit more discussion, but it, I think that Ferber helps us uh, get a better and clearer understanding of what we're talking about when we look at this uh, from from perspective at, of attribution. But when it comes to the providers of the data, it's quite important to make that distinction too, because they have the effort of making these files available. So being able to name where you got them from is quite important for the providers of the files. So 
Ferber turn, turned out to be really useful because it helps us ensure reproducibility, um, knowing the source and subsequent uh, changes, the provenance, and it helps us with uh, solving some of the question of attribution, if, even though that needs a bit more work. So it helps us to understand the full path of data. And by using persistent identifiers, we can trace the origin of each version. We can um, determine whether it's a replica, derivative, or descriptive version. And um, it helps us attribute the, the um, work to, uh, it helps us att attribute the person and organization that created, realized, produced, etc. The, the the current version. And so this is um, something that there are a couple of open questions that the interest group wants to look at in uh, going forward. So this, um, even though it looks like a lot of the questions are answered around versioning, new questions popped up. And um, one of those was um, a discussion on an RDA mailing list around data republication from a domain repository into a general repository. The general repository republished data from a domain repository without prior consultation. And that caused a bit of a stir. And one of the first question was, was it legal? And the quick answer is yes. Was it ethical? Well, that was actually the more interesting discussion. Um, from one of the questions that arose is, how do we then determine which is the authoritative copy? And what do I cite? And who gets the credit for the data uh, that is cited? And how does the originator and fund of the data get recognition if the data is then uh, republished on a different platform? So we discussed this in March 2020 as a late breaking birds of a feather session at uh, the plenary 15 and again at e-research Australasia in October 2020. Um, once you get the slides, you can follow the links to the documentation of those discussions. But there were a couple of questions that um, really need answers now. Um, when research data in digital form can be so easily copied, stored in multiple places and republished through more than one repository or service. So how can humans and machine know whether they are accessing the authoritative copy of that data? And how can the authoritative source, i.e. the data center be attributed or acknowledged in the mirrored archive? Who gets the credit for the used and cited data? Do we need to rethink data licensing? Uh, because the li we, on the one hand, we want permissive licenses to make um, reuse easier. On the other hand, we want to ensure that people who want to be acknowledged for their work get their acknowledgement. And what needs to be replicated from one platform to another in order to preserve the quality standards of the original data. Um, and so the web services that make it so easy, what are the implications? And the publishers want data sets to be cited in a, pub, in a publication. And so um, that drives citation or use use rates and uh, that would would that be better be bundled in one platform or what does it mean if that's distributed across several from the licensing perspective um, there's the ethics perspective but also the expectations perspective and Kira McNeese from Cambridge University Press um, highlighted that at the um, discussion at, at RDA in 2020, um, pointing out that um, opening up data 
means that we open it up to reuse in a way that we might not approve of. Um, and we need to talk about these perceived downsides when we promote open data and permissive data licensing. It, we need to know what the expectations are and what, what we can expect. And um, I think there's still some um, education and outreach work that needs to be done so that researchers understand the risks and benefit trade-off that is tied to permissive licensing and so that they know what they sign up to or what they sign away when they publish data. And so the question is what then constitute, constitutes ethical reuse and how do we give credit? And um, so those involved in the collection, curation and sharing of data should receive appropriate rewards for their work but what is an appropriate reward? For the researchers, the main interest in, is in citation of the work. And for the data repositors, the repositories and publishers, they need to show evidence of the use and uh, traffic to their platforms. Um, so they are interested on uh, metrics on the item level. The researchers are interested in metrics on the expression level. So still open questions. The working group has ended, but it will now restart as an interest group. And here the interest group will, wants to promote the adoption of the data versioning principles, um, develop them into a set of actionable recommendations, and then analyze the principles and how the um, principles and recommendations can be applied to questions of attribution authority and the ethical questions arising from data publication and sharing. And the new interest group charter has been published. It's uh, online at RDA for comment and community review. And I invite you to join us for the next phase of the working group, uh, the interest group. So in, in, in summary, the, the work of the RDA data versioning interest group and working group understand from, uh, arose from a need to better understand data versioning. And um, the outcome from the working group was this framework of six prim principles for data versioning. Um, the data versioning principles don't exist in thin air, but they're based on other normative works like Ferber, uh, the OAIS, uh, Open Archival Information System Standard, Dynamic Data Citation, Persistent Identifier Kernel, Data Site Metadata, NASA Processing Levels, W3C, uh, Data Exchange, FAIR Principles, and others. And it's not just technical recommendations, but they also raise questions about data identity, authenticity, authority, and the ethics of data publication. So, Thank you for staying, for extending your day uh, in the US and thank you for getting up early in Australia. And I think I'll open it up to the questions and answers. Thank you so much, Jens. Um, we'll go ahead and take some time for questions now. Just a reminder, Please be sure to type your questions into the question box in your control panel. And it looks like we have a few. So if you want to just okay. <clears throat> read away, or do you want me to read them to you? So the I, I, I can see them here. And the first it's, question is, what do, do the words homoousion and homoousion mean for the split of the Christian church? Um, the very short answer, it was about the nature of Christ, whether church, whether Christ is, is God or is like God. Homo usion is like, homo usion is similar to. A subtlety that escapes us today, or oh, so many centuries later. Um, but there's, and I think, quite a nice overview on the Wikipedia page. Um, 
then Mark Watts asks, is it possible to have an expression without a manifestation? And um, products have to be in some format. So even if it's a raw format. Um, so yes um, or no, expression without manifestation. I think it doesn't make much sense to not see the whole string because the physical embodiment is the item at the end. So um, before you reach that level, it's all conceptual. And the expression, the raw data format can be the data product. It can be the expression of the work. And um, if you then don't go on and say, I will manifest this as a CSV file, or I will manifest this as a net CDF, then you can have the concept of a data product, but it's never manifested and it's then never produced into items. So theoretically, it's possible, and that's a good question to test the, the concept of whether Ferber applies to data. Um, so Amit Shurasya, I hope I've pronounced your name correct, asked a common that happens is parameters are changed to generate data. These data are often colloquially termed as versions. However, they are in reality new computations. So how does one determine whether data is a new version or new distinct item? So this is where we come into the field of, of provenance, which we didn't cover in much detail in our work. Um, because it, um, it then becomes a question of the significance of the change. Um, and that's something that the designated community needs to understand whether the twiddling the parameters is just a legitimate change in producing a better product or whether this is some producing something new, producing a derived product. So there's no clear cut answers to your question, Amit, but it's it's qu quite a common question and it might be something that we should um, address in the interest group. So Tom Honeyman asks, perhaps rather than rethinking licensing, we need to rethink or clarify expectations around attribution. And that's pretty much what Kira McNeese said. Uh, we don't want more restrictive licenses because that will create all sorts of headaches in the future when we have to deal with more closed licenses. But we need to understand what the expectations are when we license something. And not everything that's legal is also socially and ethically acceptable. We know that from our everyday life. And so we need to talk about our ex expectations and what we consider good behavior and um, socially permiss permissible in the scientific community, not just legally permissible. So that, that's spot on, Tom. Um, Nicholas May asked, does designated community include providers and the consumers of data? And I think in the OAIS uh, definition, it's a one-way street. The provider has designated communities and should, and defines them. And the com consumers are the designated communities. Um, but uh, it's a good question that I haven't thought about. And um, it's, I'll, I'll dig into the standard to and see if it gets any, if it t tells me anything else than my one-way street understanding of that definition. Ji Peng, uh, hi Peng, asks a different version of data serviced by various organizations are different from various visions. I think that's versions of data products produce and serviced by the same organization. Can you elaborate on that scenario, including on how to address linkage of the current and previous versions of a data product? So if I understand the question 
correctly, then this is about the question of releases. Um, and so it is really important that the provider of the data um, documents and communicates to the designated community what the new version is and how it relates to a previous version. There are technical ways of, of making those links explicit in uh, metadata and uh, expressing that in a knowledge graph, but it's um, important in the sense of the users understanding what that means, that this is part of the re release process to um, document and communicate that. Um, Nicholas may ask, does designated community include the providers and consumers of data? And I think I answered that uh, just a moment ago, that my reading of that is the one-way street of the consumers being the designated community of a provider, but I think I should look at that again. Hassan Hodge asks, can you go back to the slide about communities that need to be able to understand your data and provide more examples of how that is used? I think we're running out of time, but that would be something to look into in, at the interest group. Um, it, I see that um, better defining the designated community is, is a really important issue. And Romain, David asks, imagine you are in a network without versioning usage. What is the first step to propose? Um, tough question. How, how do you start this process in the community that doesn't do this so far? Um, I think the community then might start with discussing what constitutes the changes from one to the other and how they want to identify that and, and communicate it. It's not an easy answer if you have to start from scratch. Someone put an answer in chat. Just start slapping versions on stuff. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Maria Esteva. So ask, can a new version of data due to content change, addition of new files, have a new added or author or removed author? Um, that is the catalog question in some way, attribution question on the, um, also a good question that might need further discussion by Intuitive answer to that would be, since I really like the concept of the work as the intellectual and creative endeavor, um, is that a, if that is a really significant change that somebody uh, was added or stepped away from this or was removed from this work, um, if that is a significant change, it should be communicated. And then Tom Honeyman asks. Uh, hey, Jens, I just yes. want to go back to Maria's comment. This yes. is Leslie. Um, it's really interesting. In AFCO, have a procedure in dealing with that changing the authors, and they um, so like you're changing the citation because you change it. You could be changing the authors, and mm -hmm. so they still create a series where you know it's the same data set, but that the attribution of authors are changing. Um, I can- But in Maria's, in, in Maria's case, there's also a change of, of the content. The yeah. new, so the, the, that's not just changing the catalog entry and, and yeah. editing who contributed, but there's also a change in the content. So I think this is, is a version change because- um, yeah. 
both. The other way it's a version change. That's the UNAVCO thing because they're mm -hmm. taking time series data on sets of data on stations. And so the authors collecting the data are changing with time and so is the data. But anyway, I better move on to the next question. Yeah, Tom Honeyman asks, is the environment of creation of a component of the work or ex is the environment of creation a component of the work or expression? Um, it's part, I think it's on the, the, the environment of creation, if it's a technical environment, uh, would be actually the transition from um, expression to manifestation, because you're moving towards the physical embodiment of the work. The work is an abstract entity. It's just the idea of what, what you were what you were doing, which is then expressed as a data product. So if, if you talk about the environment as as an intellectual environment, then the, um, the um, that environment is as a component of the work. But I think you're talk you talking about the technical environment where I see that in in going from the data product, the expression to a manifestation in a specific file form, and then putting items uh, out there uh, as a physical embodiment of that. Um, we don't have enough time for this last one. Okay. So what we can do is I can put this in a Google Doc and you can answer it and I will send the answer to everyone. How's that? Okay. So I think give you that's some what we need to do. But <laughs> okay. thank you very much for all the questions. It's been yeah. a great discussion. Thank you so much, Jens, um, for the very informative presentation. And Leslie, for helping with the webinar Q&A session and, and the pre-webinar pre support. And to the audience for your insightful questions and contributions. As mentioned earlier, this webinar and slide decks will be available on the RDA website. And please, if you're not a member yet of RDA, please take a moment. Um, the URL is on the screen and uh, join, join. So on behalf of RDA and RDA US, thank you for joining us today. We hope to see you again soon. Best wishes, good health to all of you. Thank you very much everybody for joining and have a great evening on the great day.